Today I'm going to continue talking about love. Uh, last week, or, or I want to say, uh, I, I want to more so talk about being a disciple of Jesus. Everyone say a disciple of Jesus. In the book of Matthew chapter 28, a very well-known scripture in verses 19 and 20, this is where Jesus said, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. When he says all nations, he's talking about all kinds of people or all kinds of ethnic groups and all kinds of nationalities there. He's saying, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. To obey all the commands I have given you. Now I said that to be a disciple of, to be saved by the grace of Jesus is one thing, but then to be a disciple of Jesus is to make a a, um, a very uh, um, you know um, deliberate choice in your life. All right, to be a disciple of Jesus to it means to understand that he is your teacher and that you are now his student and that you're going to follow his teachings, that you're not going to just take his teachings as a mere suggestion in your life, but you, you are going to uh, uh, humble yourself to what he says, that you're going to obey his uh, word even when you don't feel like obeying his word. All right, that's what a disciple is. Now, once we understood that we ought to be disciples, we, un we qu quickly understood that one of the ways we, uh, that the world will know that we are a disciple of Christ is by walking in love. Not by merely showing power, not by praying in tongues in front of uh, the unsaved people, not by clapping and worshiping God and praising God, not by you attending a church service or attending a Bible study like this, but you, the way the world, the outside world, the way the unbeliever is going to know and say, hey, wait a minute, I recognize this guy uh, uh, behaving a certain way. I recognize the way this woman behaves, and I believe, based on how they live, I believe they're a disciple of Jesus Christ. I believe they are a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Now, we quickly understand that that's not an easy thing to do. In fact, I made the statement, uh, I don't know if I'd made it last Wednesday or during uh, the Sunday service, uh, I said, to be, the, the Christian life is not a hard life, the Christian life is an impossible life, all right? And however, we're called to live an impossible life. We're called to live an impossible life because the grace of God is made available to us. Okay, so it's like a saying, if someone says, hey, uh, um, you know, Ben, I need you to fly to uh, uh, Mumbai by, by midnight, right? I need you to fly to Mumbai by, by midnight. Now, what they don't expect me to do is not go to a, the tallest uh, uh, tower or tallest building in Hyderabad and then jump and quickly flap my hands. That's not what they mean. They know in my strength, I can do it. What they mean by that is they also know, hey, there's a technology available today in the world that's called an airplane. And you can actually sit in one of those things, have no ability to fly whatsoever. You don't even, I don't even have the ability to fly uh, 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 five feet away from where I'm standing right now. All right? And yet they will say, hey, I need you to fly to Mumbai by the end of the night. And what they're saying is, not by your own strength. We're not expecting you to just keep flapping your arms. We expect you to get into an airplane, and the airplane will take care of you actually reaching Mumbai. In the same way, when the scripture tells us certain things about walking in love, God is not expecting, and Jesus is not expecting you to somehow muster up the ability to somehow walk in love. Is to muster up the ability to say, you know, I forgive and, uh, you know, they've done hard things, but I forgive. And, and one of the verses that we read, um, let me see if I can find it. Um, he, he, we talked about this, uh, yeah, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Let, let's just go there, please. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. That means he says, the way you love people, let it be genuine love. Let it not be a made up thing. Oh, you know, and sometimes uh, as Christians, we know we're supposed to love. So here's one of the things we do. We say, 
I forgive them. I don't feel like forgiving them. I don't care what happens in their life, but I forgive them. You know, just because I have to love them, I'm, I'm just going to say I love them, but in my heart, I really don't care for them. I really don't love them. Well, that's not the kind of love God wants us to walk in. God wants us to walk in a love that is pure in nature. And you and I know pure love cannot come out of our own hearts. Pure love can only come out of the new born again person's heart. Right? It's not possible by the natural man. It may be possible to love your spouse that way to a certain degree. It may be un un until they tick you off unless they upset you, unless they don't do the things you expect them to do, unless they go uh, disagree with you, right? Until that point, maybe you can love your spouse really well. Maybe you can love your children and you can say, oh, children are my world, my children are my world. You know, I, I, you know, I love them, I love them, I love them. Well, maybe you love them, you love them, you love them until they do something so embarrassing that you can't even walk out of your house. Maybe they get into uh, 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 addictions, that, and, and now you, you say, like, I don't even know what to say about you to my relatives and to my uh, 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 you know, colleagues. And, and, and all of a sudden, that love that you thought you had for them, all of a sudden, it gets tainted. Because that love that God is talking about is not really possible by the natural man. And that's why in Romans 5 and verse 5, we saw, and I ended with this, I said, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to say, God, this is in my natural ability, this is impossible. There's no way I can love those people. After what they did to me, after what they did to my family, after what they did to my spouse, after what they did to my children, or to my parents, or to my company, after how they lied about me, how they cheated me, and, you know, and the list can go on and on and on. And I know for every one of you that's watching this, there, there's every one of you have a story in your life where you felt you were done wrong by somebody. There's nobody that's watching this right now and nobody that is going to watch this later on that will say, you know what? Nobody has done anything wrong to me in my life. Nobody will say that. Every one of you have a story to sit down and to explain as to why or, you know, how somebody did you wrong, how somebody mistreated you, how somebody used you. And lied about you and cheated you. And the list goes on and on. And therefore, God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my own love and I'm going to pour it out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. And he says, now, by what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. See, all the commands of Jesus could only be possible by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You understand that? So even when you read the, the, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is technically, for the most part, still the Old Testament, because until Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, that's when the new covenant begins. So up to that point, every teaching that Jesus teaches, he's teaching it under the old covenant. So when Jesus talks about forgiveness, when Jesus talks about walking in love, and Jesus talks about all of these parables, understand this, he is talking to an audience that cannot do what he's telling them to do. Not in their own strength and ability. That's why even though Jesus says, hey, go ye make disciples of all men, when do they start? They don't start right away. Jesus goes to the Father, they already have the instruction saying, go and make disciples of all nations. And yet, the work doesn't start. Now, when does the work start? Only after the Holy Spirit begins to invade their lives. So in the book of Acts, we see they're already the disciples of Jesus. They already have the instructions from Jesus. And yet, they needed somebody. They needed the helper. They needed the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit descends upon them. And guess what happens? Now they move into action. Now they go into all the world and start making disciples of all nations. 
making disciples and teaching them what Jesus taught them so that now with that empowerment, they can do what they could not do before. All right. I hope this is making sense. All right. Now, go, let's go uh, to uh, Romans chapter 4, please. Rome, uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And starting from verse 9. Now, this is Paul speaking. He says, but concerning brotherly love for all other uh, Christians, you have no need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been personally taught by God to love one another. In verse 10, towards the end, end uh, the, the ending there, he says, but I beseech you and earnestly exhort your brethren that you excel in this matter more and more. All right. That means he's saying, I want you to continue to excel in this process of walking in love. Now, if you're taking notes, write a couple of these, uh, these things down. Now, as, you, as we start becoming a disciple of Jesus, as we start thinking about walking in love, every one of us need to ask ourselves this question a lot in our lives. All right? And that question is, before you do something or after you do something, was that love? Was that love? When you do something to the person next to you, when you did something to, when you spoke certain words to your neighbor, when you spoke certain words to your family member, to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your in-laws, when you spoke certain things to your employer, employee, whoever it is, is was that done in love? Was that done in love? Even since last week. So it's been seven days uh, uh, since we started talking about this. When you look back at the last seven days of your life, can you trace back to certain conversations that you had, certain interactions that you had with people? And when you look back at those interactions, when you look back at those conversations, can you say, hey, you know what? I did, I did uh, uh, speak in love. I was walking in the love of God. Can you say that? Or, was it, or when you look back at your life, will you say, you know what? Most of the time, I just did it my way. Most of the time, I just did it based on my feelings. I was frustrated and therefore I just said certain things. I just felt selfish in that time, so therefore I preferred myself over preferring other people. So this is something practically that you've got to uh, wrestle with and practically that you've got to think on a consistent basis. Now also understand this, walking in love has nothing to do with feelings. Walking in love has nothing to do with feelings. Now, there are a lot of times when you feel love deep down on the inside of you. You do. I mean, when it comes to your, especially when it comes to your significant other, when it comes to your spouse, when it comes to your children and other family members, there are feelings of love. Now, here's the point. But loving people when you've got feelings of love is easy. That's not a hard thing to do. Anybody can love the lovable. But when Jesus talks about walking in love, and when you think about yourself as a disciple of Jesus, now you've got to understand, real love is showing and walking in love even when you don't feel like it. Even when you don't feel like it. Why? Because now you're not doing this based on your own uh, uh, um, you know, feelings and your own thoughts. You are doing this as a disciple. I want this to uh, uh, renew your mind. I want this to register in your hearts that you are now a disciple of Jesus. Once you say you're a disciple of Jesus, here's what you're saying. You're saying, not my will, but the teacher's will. When you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, you're saying, not my word, but his word. When you're saying, I'm a disciple of Jesus, you're saying, I, I prefer the words of Jesus over my own words. The thoughts of Jesus over my thoughts. The wisdom of Jesus over my wisdom. That's what a disciple does. Now, when you obey the word and start walking in love, the feelings will eventually follow up. See, when you don't feel like forgiving somebody, when you don't feel like uh, uh, um, walking in love towards certain people, and yet you choose to, yet you choose to fall, w walk in love, that's when the feelings will follow later on. 
But you are not looking for the feeling to validate what you are doing. You've got to go based on what Jesus said, what his word says. And therefore, and after that, now the, follow, the, the, the feelings can follow up. Go with me to Romans chapter 13, please. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 and starting from verse 8. It says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. You see that? For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall commit adultery. Sorry, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, and all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall not love your neighbor as yourself. What is he saying? He's saying if you love your neighbor, or if you love the people in your life, if you love the people, again, when we talk about neighbor, I don't want you to think about just your flatmate or, or, or the person living next door to you or the person who lives right next to you. Neighbor meaning anyone who's close to you is your neighbor. Anyone that you interact with on a regular basis is your neighbor. All right. So here he says, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not commit adultery. You will not commit murder. You will not steal from them. You will not bear false witness against them. So he says, if you love your neighbor as yourself, this will take, be taken care of. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I'll read the verse 10 from the Amplified Version, and this is what it says. It says, love does no wrong to one's neighbor. It never hurts anybody. Therefore, love meets all the requirements and is the fulfilling of the law. See, you cannot say that you're walking in love and wish for another person's harm. You cannot say you're walking in love and wish harm upon someone else. Now, let, let me take this a step further. See, even as I'm speaking about God's grace on Sundays, and I want you to put these things together. Uh, when you understand God's grace upon your life, see, sometimes when, when we um, talk about certain people or you may give advice to certain people, they don't follow that advice, and because they don't follow that, uh, uh, that particular advice in their life, they get hurt in their life. And a lot of times, the, the, the natural tendency is to say, well, should have listened. Right? Should have listened. Not my fault. They should have listened to me. Now, here's what I want you to know. The spirit of grace does not take pleasure in their fall, even if they did not listen to you. The spirit of grace, the spirit of love. See, that's why, we, you know, think about Jesus. Would Jesus look at someone and say, well, you should have had more faith. Hey, you should have done this. You should have done that. No, Jesus was a forgiving savior. And here's what I want us to know. We've got to carry the same spirit of grace and love in our lives. We're not just receiving the grace of God in our lives, but we have to be people who extend that same grace upon the lives of the people that we come in contact with. And so we don't uh, 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 relish in somebody's harm. We don't enjoy that they did not listen to us and they fell to their knees or they fell uh, 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 flat on their face. But even in that moment, love says, man, I'm going to pray for them. Man, I wish they're going to come back. Man, I wish they could stand back upon their feet. Why? Because you're always thinking about restoration for their lives. Amen? Go with me to 1 John chapter 4, please. 1 John chapter 4. Now, I may, not, I may not be going into certain details, but even as I'm talking about this, I want you to let the Holy Spirit minister to you and bring certain things to your remembrance and into your mind. Because here's what I know. Some of you have issues in your families, not because I know your family issues, but I'm just telling you, with the number of people that are watching us online and who will watch this later on, I just know people have issues in families. I know people have issues in their relationships, in their friendships, in their business relationships. And I want you to know that if you are dealing with a, 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 an issue in your heart where you want someone else to fall, that's not of love. 
And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit for help to get that out of your heart because that's not the spirit of grace that you and I are supposed to carry in our lives. All right? All right. First John chapter 4 and starting from verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Why should we do this? For God is, for, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In, in this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God had sent his only begotten son into this world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, the, the, uh, uh, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, this John is called the apostle of love. All right. And what is he saying? He's saying the way we even understand love in our minds is not based on a movie. The way we understand love is not based on a romantic novel. The way we understand love is not based on any human relationship. John says the way we understand love is based on what God has done for us. Now, what did God do for us? The Bible lets us know that God sent his only begotten son for us while we were yet sinners. While we were still in our trespasses and sins, God sent his only begotten son for us. And he says, in that action of giving something, is love known by us? Is love known by us? And in that action of giving also came forgiving. Giving and forgiving go hand in hand. God not only gave, God's love does not only give, but it also forgives. Giving and forgiving go hand in hand. And so he says, here's how we understand love. We understand love because something was given to us and something was forgiven of us. Given to us and forgiven of us. That's how he says we understand love. And he says, if we understand love based on this, and if we have already experienced this kind of love, that means we have received, we have been recipients of the grace of God. He says, if we have been recipients of the grace of God, he says, if, if God so loved us, verse 11, we also ought to love one another. He says, now, when you think about your relationship issues, when you think about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, again, even when we talk about love, I, I know I'm talking on a personal note when it comes to your family and relationship issues and other things, but I also want you to think about uh, uh, um, certain political parties that you may not like, certain uh, uh, groups of people that you don't like, and that group of people might be on the other side of the world. It doesn't matter. The point is that you don't harbor harm towards anybody. That you don't harbor ill will towards anybody. See, God loved us while we were yet sinners. While we did not deserve the love of God, he loved us. While we did not deserve the forgiveness of God, he forgave us. And so now John says, hey, if we, by the grace of God, were forgiven... If we, by the grace of God, were given the free gift of salvation, he says, how much more should we respond that way? How much more should we live the same kind of life that Jesus came to show us? If we're indeed his disciples, then guess what? We have to be living like Jesus. Living like Jesus. Because if we're not living like Jesus, maybe, just maybe, you haven't taken being a disciple of Jesus seriously. All right? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Starting from verse 31. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. 
as well as all types of evil behavior. See, he talks about bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as evil behavior. Evil behavior. Now, I, in the world that we live in today, we can talk about all of those things as just personality disorders. I mean, like, we can come up with a psychological explanation for these things. You know, I'm, you know, you, you don't, Pastor, you, Pastor, if you knew what they did to me, you would tell me I have a right to be bitter against them. Pastor, because of what they did to me, my entire business shut down, Pastor. I am bitter against them. Well, the Bible says that bitterness is evil in the sight of God. Well, I'm just angry. You know, I, you know I, that's just the way I am. It's my temperament. That's just the way I am. Like, if people don't listen to me, I just get angry. If people don't do things exactly the way I want them to be done... I just get angry. Well, the Bible calls that evil. Rage. Pastor, you don't know my, what my father did to me. You don't know what my mother did to me. You don't know what my employer did to me. And therefore, my rage against them is justified. You don't know what my in-laws did to me. Therefore, my rage is justified. Okay? The Bible calls that evil. Evil behavior. Harsh words. The Bible calls harsh words as evil. Slander. What is slander? To talk evil, uh, to, to talk uh, uh, negatively about somebody. False information, spreading rumors. Oh, you know, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, we're talking about this just so that we can pray for them. Really? Really? Oh, you know, I heard that they said this, and therefore I'm taking that information, which is not first-hand information. It is fourth-hand information, but I'm going to take fourth-hand information and go make sure that by the end of the day, it becomes tenth-hand information. Right? And that goes on and on and on and on. Slander. And he says, slandering is an evil behavior. Now, he says, get rid of these things. Now, if Paul says, he's, when, when Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, he's talking, talking to born-again believers. He's talking to people in the church. The reason he's talking about this to people in the church is because there are people in the church with these issues. And let me say this. If Paul had to talk to the church in Ephesus about these issues, guess what? There are people who are joining me right now online who are in New City Church, who are watching from uh, uh, in the church at large, who are dealing with the same issues today in 2021. It's the same issues, dealing with the same issues. And guess what? Paul says, because the Holy Spirit is residing on the inside of you, because you're a born-again child of God, because the, the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts, he says, now you've got the capacity, the ability to get rid of these things in your life. To get rid of these things in your life. Now, the next verse, he says, instead of these things, he says, be kind to each other. Another word for kind is nice. Like, you know, a, a lot of times in the world that we live in today, you meet somewhere and he says, you know, I, I feel like he's a nice person. He's a nice guy. She's a nice girl. She's a nice woman. What do we mean by that? It's a kind person. When, some, when you have an interaction with somebody, do they walk away from that interaction saying, that's a kind person? I don't know if I'll do business with them, but that's a kind person. I don't like the deal that they have with me, that, that they want to give. But you know what? Even if I don't do the deal, I, you know, I have to say, I have to admit, that person, she's a kind person. He's a kind person. You know, that, that, that person who, uh, uh, who's my uh, um, uh, co-worker, you know, we don't, you know, we hardly work together on the same project. But when I do, it's a job. You know why? Because that person is a kind person. A kind person. He says, instead, be kind to each other. How, how do I do this? Tender-hearted. You know, another word for tender-hearted is soft-hearted. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be hard-hearted. Be tender-hearted. 
hearted. Then he says, forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. He says, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Now, how should we do that? What's the example? Who's our example? He says, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. That's the standard. That's the example. He says, be kind to people. Don't be a mean Christian. Don't be a Christian that's carrying bitterness in your heart. Don't be a Christian that's angry all the time. Don't be a Christian that's, that's you know, high, you, you know, high maintenance Christian. Don't be a high maintenance Christian. Be a low maintenance Christian. The world doesn't have to serve you. You've got to serve the people around you. Don't enter into a place and have this expectation of everyone get to attention. The guy has shown up. No, you walk into a place, even if you're the boss, you walk into a place with a heart of a servant, tender-hearted, ready to forgive. See, if you prepare your heart in the morning saying, you know what, God, I come before you. Thank you that this is the day that you've made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God, whatever has happened yesterday is yesterday. It is of my past. So Lord, today, as I wake up, as I start my day, I am going to be determined, Father, by the help of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, to be kind to the people I meet today. I'm going to be tender-hearted, God. I'm going to forgive people. Lord, in fact, I make a decision right now. While I'm still in my bed, I make a decision right now. Whoever needs to be forgiven today, I forgive them already. What, what are you doing? You are preparing your heart to be a disciple of Jesus when you go to the office, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the mall, when you have to deal with people. You're saying, hey, before I enter the church, before I go to the mall, I know there might be a waiter who does not uh, behave properly with me. I know there might be somebody in the supermarket that might uh, not uh, help me the way I need uh, uh, help. I know I might get a call from one of my relatives or a friend, and that might upset me. But you know what? Before I I get the call before I walk out of the house I choose to forgive them I choose to forgive them why because I'm a disciple of Jesus that's why that's why and because the world out there my responsibility is to be an ambassador of God to be an ambassador of Christ I wear the responsibility of being a disciple and so wherever I go I go with that attitude Wherever I go, I go to serve. The way Jesus walked around looking for a way to serve people and love people. The same portion of scripture, I want to read it from the Amplified Version. E Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. It says, let all bitterness and indignation and wrath. He says, passion, rage. He includes bad temper. Right? Anybody dealing with bad temper? Right? Anybody dealing with ind indignation? Anybody dealing with bitterness in your heart? He says, and resentment. Any resentment in your heart? Because of what took place in your life? Because of what someone else did? Because of what a group of people did? Because of what an organization did? Maybe it's a church that did something. Maybe it's a group of people in the church that did something. Do you have resentment in your heart regarding that? He says anger and animosity. And he says and quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention. Uh, do, do, do you have, uh, are you contentious all the time? I mean, any conversation, you know, people don't know when you might blow up in that conversation. Everyone's like, hey, hey don't mess with him. You know, he, he'll, he'll go crazy. He'll go crazy. Are you contentious and slander, evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language? He says, let all these things, he says, be banished from you with all malice, spite, ill will or baseness of any kind. He says, all of these things should not be part of our lives as disciples of Jesus. He says, verse 32, and become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tender-hearted. He says, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, compassionate. 
The Bible says every single time Jesus healed somebody, the Bible uh, uh, um, uh, precedes that by saying he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. That's how he, when Jesus saw a leper, he just did not see a person that was cursed. He was moved with compassion to get that person out of that situation. That's how he lived his life. Then he goes on to say, understanding. Yeah, maybe somebody did not do things the way you want them to do. But t can you take a moment to maybe understand where they are in life? Maybe understand that they didn't have a great day when it started off. Maybe they got some bad news to when they were about to get to the job. Can you be a little more understanding? Can we be a little more understanding with the people that we come in contact with? Then he says, loving hearted, forgiving one another. He says, readily and freely, as God in Christ forgave you. Readily and freely forgiving people. Readily and freely forgiving people. You know, it's, uh, um, when it, whenever it comes to forgiving, I, I think about what um, Peter asks Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter, I'll, and maybe I'll close with this, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? How often should I forgive them? And then he comes up with this great number. He says, seven times? And I can almost imagine Peter thinking, okay, this is going to be a big number. And Jesus is going to say, no, 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 you don't have to do it seven times. You know, three times max, it's enough. And so Peter says, Jesus, seven times. You know, seven is a great number. Should we stop it at that level? And Jesus replies, and he says, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 70 times, seven. like Jesus completely blows, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Peter's expectations out of the water. Completely blows his number out. He says seven, he says no, 70 times seven. And, 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 and that's not in a lifetime, by the way. Not in a lifetime, but he says in a day. Now think about this. How often have you asked God for forgiveness? How often have you asked God for forgiveness? And here's the thing. You know how we try to justify this? We say, but, but pastor, they should change in their behavior. You know, uh, uh, they keep doing the same thing. How many times should I forgive? Well, how many times did you keep asking God for forgiveness about the same issue? Same issue. I'm not talking about you asking God for forgiveness for different things in your life. I'm saying, how many times did you ask God for forgiveness for repeating the same thing that you promised him that you will not repeat? You went to the altar crying and, and, and snot coming out of your nose and you're kneeling on the altar and you're saying, Jesus, forgive me. I'll never do this, Lord. Never do this again. And you leave that meeting only to ask for forgiveness again. How many times have you asked for forgiveness? See, all of a sudden, we, we, we think, well, that's God, and that's my personal relationship with God. And this is just this human being who's really upsetting me. Here's my point. Receiving the grace of God is one thing. To be a disciple is a different and I'm talking about you becoming a disciple, maturing in the things of God, maturing in the things of God, growing in the things of God for your life. And as you mature in the things of God, you quickly understand, wait a minute, whatever I received from God, now I've got to be a dispenser of the same love, the same grace, and same forgiveness to the people in my life. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. No, my friend, you just forgot what you did to God. You just forgot what Jesus did for you. The more you realize what Jesus did for you, the less of an issue it will be what others did to you. 
I'll say that again. The more you focus and realize what Jesus did for you, the less of an issue it will be what others do to you. It's not your responsibility to, to uh, manage their behavior. It is, however, your responsibility to make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to do. See, it wasn't Jesus' responsibility how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the Roman soldiers uh, uh, responded to Jesus. It was only Jesus' responsibility to be upon that cross and still say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When Stephen, the first martyr who was being stoned to death, it was not his responsibility to control the behavior of the crowd. He didn't start shouting and saying, hey, I'm, 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 I'm speaking the right message. You stop throwing the stones. It wasn't his responsibility about how they responded. It was, however, his responsibility to forgive. And therefore, he stands there. He being persecuted, being uh, uh, stoned to death. He says, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. That was a man of maturity. You know what? Everyone who stoned him knew that that man was a disciple of Jesus. He knew it. They knew it based on how he lived his life. Based on how he lived his life. Now we're out of time, but here's what I want you to know. Even for those of you, you've gone through bad situations. People have done what might seem like unforgivable things to you. The longer you keep that grudge, the longer you keep that hold in your life, you will be damming up and blocking the free flow of the Spirit and the free flow of the grace of God in your life. You might think that you're holding the offender back in life. The reality is you're holding yourself back. You yourself are holding yourself from experiencing the free flow of the love and the grace of God in your life. When you begin to understand that walking in love is something that you've got to practice in your life, then you begin to look at everything that happens in your life as an opportunity to grow. See, I want you to change the way you look at obstacles in your life. Every obstacle, every offense that you experience in your life, every negative comment you hear, every mistreatment that you experience, Always take it upon yourself as an opportunity to grow. As an opportunity to grow in the love of God. It's not your opportunity to, to, to defend yourself. It's not your responsibility to defend yourself. It's God's responsibility to defend you. Your responsibility is to simply walk in love. Let God be your defender. Let God be the one who takes care of you. Let his free flow of grace and love and mercy not be blocked up in your life because of the things that you are holding on to so tightly. Don't let bitterness, don't let anger, don't let selfishness, don't let any of these things hold you back any longer. Be humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. He will exalt you in due time. He is a God that keeps his word. And he said, if you obey him, if you humble yourself against his mighty hand, he will exalt you. And to be a disciple of Jesus means to say, God, not my will, let yours be done, not my way. Let your way manifest in my life. As you have freely forgiven me, I forgive. As you have freely loved me, I love the people that I come in contact with.
And I determine, Lord, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to be kind and tender-hearted towards the people I come in contact with. Amen?